The Battle of Berlin, a timeline. Robin Umkes Kreuzberger and Marcel Kruger provide a local timeline of W2's Battle of Berlin. The events loss are distant and strange, but they happened not very long ago to that woman sitting right in front of me, insisting I take another slice of bread and butter and a fresh cup of tea. Anna Reed, Leningrad. In the spring of 1945, after six years of war, the last major battle in Europe was fought between the Soviet Union and Hitler's Third Reich. The Battle of Berlin, one of the most bitterly contested offensives of the entire war, saw a gigantic army of 2.5 million men unleashed in a deadly assault against the remnants of the Wehrmacht, an assault designed to crush Nazi Germany once and for all. For the Soviet Union, Berlin was the ultimate prize, the city being the heart of the Reich and the place where Adolf Hitler was hiding in his bunker. If Berlin could be captured by the Red Army before English and American troops reached it, most of Central and Eastern Europe could be brought under communist control. For Adolf Hitler and his most fanatical followers, there seemed to be still some misguided hope to defeat the Red Army at the gates of the capital. In reality, the Nazis' final defiant and vain gestures served only to prolong a bloody and horrific battle. In the burning ruins of Berlin, hundreds of thousands of Russian and German lives were lost, and the resultant Soviet victory would divide the city and the continent for the next 44 years. Both legacies, the war and the Iron Curtain, have shaped and continue to shape in some ways the contemporary city many of us today call home. April 16, 1945, Battle of Silo Heights. From their positions on the Oder Nysa line, Soviet 1st Belarusian and Soviet 1st Ukrainian fronts begin their final push on Berlin. Hitler's order of the day, dated on the previous day, is released to all German troops, ordering that anyone found fleeing in the face of the Soviet attack is to be arrested or shot. Even with 50% of Germany already occupied by Allied forces in February 1945 and no realistic hope of a military victory, Adolf Hitler showed no signs of surrender, preferring to fight to the bitter end bringing country and population down with him. From September 1944 onwards, Goebbels finally got the total war that he had demanded in his February 1943 Sportpalast speech. It meant that all of German society was now drafted into the war effort, including previously exempt workers in sectors like postal services, the railways, theaters, and newspapers. Most workers thus released were sent to the front. Those too old or young for active service were put in the Volkssturm, an inexperienced, underarmed militia charged with defending the fatherland against the approaching allies. To force the Nazi leadership and army high command to surrender, the allies needed to conquer Berlin. The job was left to the Soviet forces advancing from the east, and the first step was the Battle of Silo Heights. Silo is a small market town on the B1 road, close to where it crosses the Oder River into Poland. The B1 used to be Reichstrasse 1, which ran all the way across Prussia, some 1,300 KME from the Dutch border at Aachen in the west to Konigsberg, today's Kaliningrad in the east. Marshal Georgi Zhukov, the commander of the 1st Belarusian Front, had been pushing back Nazi forces through Ukraine and Poland since October 1943. In January 1945, he finally reached the oder nysa line at Kosterzin, the point where Reichstrasse 1 crossed the river. Here, his armies kept their position in the floodplain of the Oder River only 70 kilometers from Berlin's Alexanderplatz, waiting for other Soviet army units to spread to the north and south to allow for a full encirclement of Berlin. By April 16th, sufficient forces had finished their mopping up operations further east for the final push to the German capital. General Theodor Buss's 9th Army, consisting mainly of underarmed Hitler Youth Boys and untrained Volkssturm fighters, had prepared its defenses on a north-south ridge in the landscape some 90 meters high flanking the Oder's floodplain and centered on Silo, where Reichstrasse 1 scaled the heights. This was the last defensible natural barrier protecting Berlin from the east. The attack started before dawn. The Red Army used runway floodlights to light the battlefield and blind their opponents. But in the early morning mists, they only served to backlight the advancing infantry. Pushing across the muddy floodplain up onto the well-defended heights proved to be more difficult than expected, and the battle dragged on for days causing heavy casualties on both sides. Only after two days of fighting, the Soviet troops managed to break the German forces' third line of defense at Silo, and from then on, not much stood in their way until reaching Berlin's city limits. The Battle of Silo Heights turned out to be the last entrenched battle in the senselessly protracted war between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. When the Battle of Berlin was over and Germany had capitulated, 
the Red Army wanted to honor its dead and mark its victory. Marshal Zhukov, who stayed on as military commander of Berlin in the Soviet occupation zone, commissioned three monuments immediately after hostilities ceased in May 1945. The famous Soviet war memorial on Strasse de 17, Juni in Berlin's Tiergarten, the monument at Seelauer Heights, and an obelisk at Kosterzin, just up the road in Poland which was removed by Polish authorities in 2008. The monument at Silo was created by Lev Kerbel, who also designed the Tiergarten Memorial. The Red Army didn't waste time. Both monuments were inaugurated in November 1945. The Silo statue shows a Red Army soldier with his hand on the turret of a defeated German tank. From the beginning, the memorial included war graves, but most Soviet and German casualties of the battle are buried elsewhere, at Liebes and Lietzen cemeteries respectively. April 23, 1945. Soviet troops reached the outskirts of Berlin. Between April 18, 1945 and April 23, several significant events occurred. On the 18th, Joseph Goebbels burned files in his office as Soviet troops approached and moved with his wife and children into Hitler's bunker. He later poisoned them all and committed suicide alongside his wife. On the 21st, Soviet infantry reached Berlin and Adolf Hitler ordered an all-out counterattack against the Soviets at Berlin under the command of SS General Felix Steiner, a counterattack that was never attempted. On the 22nd, Soviet 1st Byelorussian Front penetrated the Berlin suburbs from the east and north. Adolf Hitler learned that the counterattack he ordered on the previous day was never carried out by General Steiner and grew furious. When told by Wilhelm Keitel that Soviet tanks were now entering the city, Hitler conceded that the end is near and decided to burn the most important papers stored at the bunker and remain in Berlin. Day in and day out, civilians were exposed to constant long-range air and mortar attacks and spent most of the battle in cellars and basements. Above ground, there was intensive hand-to-hand -hand fighting as German soldiers and especially the SS defended their streets and houses to the death. With typical black Galgen humor, gallows humor, Berliners started calling their city the Reichscheiterhaufen, the Imperial Pyre, and Berlin women allegedly said that it was better to have a Russian on the belly than an American on the head referring to both the Allied bombing raids and the rapes committed by Red Army soldiers. The filth, stench, and gloom in the shelters grew worse by the hours as water supplies collapsed. Generators provided power only for a few hours, if at all. One of the largest shelters, the Anhalter Bahnhof, housed 12,000 people in conditions so hideously cramped that they were unable to move, even to relieve themselves for days on end. Bullets sometimes whipped for thousands of yards across empty air until they found a target in flesh or brick. A woman sitting up in the bed where she had taken refuge beside her husband was killed by a round fired a mile or more away, which ricocheted off the wall. A pall of dust and smoke shrouded the whole city as street by street the battle continued. Alexander Shalomatov, Red Army tank driver, on the morning of 23rd April, our team, reinforced by units of the 29th Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade, continued the offensive in the direction of Stansdorf. Our task was to cross the Telto Canal and seize the southwestern outskirts of Berlin. In the evening on April 24th, our team, overcoming fierce resistance Germans, came to the southern outskirts of Berlin. On the streets everywhere were barricades with disguised anti-aircraft guns hidden behind. In basements and backyards, German soldiers with bazookas lurked and the fighting was hard. However, by the evening of the next day, we took the train station and seized Lichterfelde district. We were helped by a Berlin engineer of Russian nationality. How he came here and how he survived in the city before we reached it, I don't know, but he knew Berlin and competently told us about the layout of the streets and the general situation in the city. He saved a lot of lives. On April 26th, our team captured the Schmargendorf area and in the afternoon came to the Charlottenburg district. In the evening the same day, our brigade was ordered to turn around 180 degrees and advance in the direction of Potsdam. April 25, 1945, the blowing up of karstadt hermannplatz On April 25, 1945, with the battle in full swing, its outcome was more or less clear. While the Red Army pushed relentlessly into the city from all directions, many of Hitler's subordinates had given up all hope of victory and focused more on survival. It was time to burn the bridges. At the western end of Hermannplatz in Berlin-Kreuzberg, the members of the SS Division Nordland, mostly French, Belgian, and Scandinavian volunteers, led by their newly appointed head SS Brigadenführer Gustav Krukenberg, finished installing the explosives necessary to blow up the old Karstadt department store. During the war, Karstadt am Hermannplatz 
once the biggest and most modern department store in Europe, was used as a food storage and also the Heeresbekleidung Samt, Hitler's army clothing board. But it was neither the food supplies, almost gone by then anyway, nor the garments that made the department store such a dangerous post to give up. It is far more probable that the Nordland troops did not wish for such a perfect assault position to fall into the hands of the enemy. Shooting from Karstadt would have been like shooting fish in a barrel. Now with the Soviet 5th Shock Army under General Berzerin already on this side of the Telto Canal and within the S-Bahn Ring, the SS troops knew they would not be able to hold their positions around Hermannplatz for long. General Katakov's 1st Guards Tank Army, which had reached Tempelhof Airport, would be reaching their stronghold soon. The decision to blow up Karstadt to prevent it from being captured, plundered and used as fortress by the Soviets was made quickly. Civilians who had come in search for food supplies inside the building were all forcefully removed, and Krukenberg himself gave a signal to blast the old department store away. Gone were the 70,000 M2 of space, the famous roof gardens, the delivery van lift and the 11-story light towers. Gone the elegant restaurants, the hair salons and the famous food court competing with that of Berlin's most elegant department store, the Kadewe. Ironically, despite the heavy fighting between what by the end turned out to be five Soviet armies and two German divisions, hardly any other buildings around Hermannplatz suffered a similar fate. And like so many other unique pre-W2 buildings in Berlin, the historic department store in Kreuzberg left behind only a tiny, hardly perceptible trace of its former glory. A small section of the original building, with the car park entrance, can be found in Hazenheide Street, and inside the new Karstadt is the original staircase, most of which survived intact and has been restored. April 25, 1945, the complete encirclement of Berlin. On the April 25, 1945, Units of the Soviet 1st Belorussian and 1st Ukrainian fronts met near Kyitsyn, completing the encirclement of Berlin. About 70 kilometers to the south, American and Soviet troops met at Torgau. Besides all the different nationalities that made up the Soviet Union and the Red Army, there were also two Polish communist armies fighting for Berlin, the 1st Army in the north and the 2nd Army attacking from the south. They made vital contributions to the fight. The Polish 1st Infantry Division, for example, bailed out a halted Red Army tank attack on the Reichstag on May 1st. Juda Petinati, a 16-year-old Red Cross nurse, remembers the scene in the city during these days. We could hardly breathe. The air was full of sulfur because of the artillery fire. A bit like New Year's Eve these days. Dust was swirling around like a fine fog, so we could hardly see where we were going. Groups of dead and wounded were everywhere. Five days later, Adolf Hitler committed suicide in his bunker. His body was burned in the garden of the Reich's Chancellery together with Eva Braun. In the Tiergarten district, Zhukov launched an assault, refusing to permit an armistice and demanding unconditional surrender. On the May 1, 1945 began the Battle of Halba, which saw the German 12 Armee retreat from Berlin to the Elbe River and attempt to begin negotiations with U.S. troops. One day later, May 2, 1945, the Soviet hammer and sickle flag was hoisted atop Berlin's Reichstag building. General Helmuth Weidling accepted General Vasily Chikov's terms of unconditional surrender. The surrender of the Berlin garrison in Germany was to be effective at 15 hours, and on the May 8, all Wehrmacht troops surrendered unconditionally. This date is today known worldwide as VE, or Victory in Europe Day. The surrender was signed and sealed at a former pioneer school in Berlin Karlshorst, which is now the German-Russian Anti-War Museum. The Battle of Berlin effectively ended the fighting on the Eastern Front and in Europe as a whole. Taking possession of Berlin, the Soviets worked to restore services and distribute food to the city's inhabitants. Seventy years on, the scars of the battle can still be seen throughout the city. Some official buildings, such as the Neues Museum, the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church and the Reichstag, have deliberately kept their damage visible as a memorial to the ravages of war. But the city is still also dotted with unofficial war-era sites, such as unrefurbished tenements, forgotten courtyards, and abandoned industrial buildings. Berlin's war bunkers played multiple roles during the war. Islands of safety for civilians during the battle, artillery platforms for the Wehrmacht, as well as the dramatic scene of Adolf Hitler's suicide. Some of these existing bunkers have been appropriated as contemporary art museums, while others, including a former flak tower at Humboldtain, which doubled as a bunker, have been made accessible to tourists and other interested parties. In the fighting for Berlin, the Soviets lost 81-116 killed missing and 282-51 wounded. 
German casualties are estimated being as high as 458,080 killed. Civilian losses may have been as high as 125,000. We should never forget them, the 16-year-old drafted Hitler youth soldiers. The families in the bunker and the farmer from Kazakhstan, who fought all the way from Russia to Berlin to defeat the Nazis. Thanks for watching. If you found this video informative, please subscribe to our channel for more stories from history.